And my first boss out of college told me um, that I was the worst employee he ever had and the company should fire me. And so that was very difficult to hear. How am I going to pay these loans? All the, all the fears and, and questions started coming up. And that's when the seed was really planted for me for uh, wanting to become a good leader, uh, wanting to become uh, really turn things around, be a good employee, learn leadership skills. How can I help others? And eventually that transferred from working in someone else's company in a, a large gas company to starting my own company. Hello, listener. Welcome back to another episode of Leading with Integrity, the podcast for new managers, first time leaders working in tech focused industries or companies who are feeling that pressure of leading teams for the first time, and you're looking for actionable advice, some insights, some real-life stories to help enhance your leadership skills and overcome some of those common challenges. And those challenges are faced by all leaders at various stages in their career, and they quite often come out of some of the failures, some of the mistakes that we make in our in finding our feet as a leader or manager. So my guest today is Matthew Pizon, Matt. And he's had quite a unique journey from early in his career being told that he should be fired up until today when he's founded his own business. He owns over 200 homes and with his wife, Anna, has grown that business from relatively humble beginnings in 2014 of renovating their first property. It's a great story. I'll let Matt tell us the background himself. I don't want to uh, spoil anything. But after over a decade of running this as a side hustle, being able to quit your corporate job is a dream for a lot of people. So it's nice to hear a story of someone who's been able to do that successfully. And of course, we're going to hear all about the leadership lessons that Matt has learned over his career as well. Really looking forward to this one because there are so many great little lessons that we can learn from some of Matt's experiences. Taking those first steps into leadership, particularly if you're trying to run your own business at the same time, can be very isolating. As you know by now, hopefully, I'm building a community, an online community to help change that and help address that loneliness at the top. So if you are a new manager, if you are a first time leader, particularly if you're in a tech space or tech focused organization, you can join for free for 60 days. All I ask in return for that is your engagement and your honest feedback. So to learn more, you can dive in anytime at www.leadernotaboss. Dot com. And without further ado, let's get Matt on the show and get stuck into this episode. Welcome to the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership Talk for the Modern Manager, with your host, David Hatch. Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a little while, actually, since I've had a guest from across the pond, so it's great to talk to someone from your neck of the woods again. Yeah, David, thanks for having me. I'm excited to share. Yeah, looking forward to it. And as ever, best place to start, I find, is going to hand you the reins for a moment to introduce yourself to the listeners. Tell them a bit about what you do, your career history as well, and what gets you out of bed in the morning. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, Matthew Pizon, based out of uh, the Philadelphia area, Pennsylvania, uh, United States. And what I do now is I buy houses, small multifamily properties. Uh, my wife and I have been doing that for 10 years, and we we operate them. Um, and uh, we hold them long term as as investment properties and provide housing. Um, but we didn't always do that. Um, I was, uh, I'm a trained chemical engineer. I like to refer to myself as a recovering chemical engineer because I'm from the fourth generation of engineers. And while I'm good at mathematics and analytics and other things, um, it, uh, it ended up not being the path that I wanted to pursue long term. Uh, when I was out of, uh, in 2010, I graduated from chemical engineering school, landed that first job. It was the depths of the financial crisis, and I was happy to have a job. I had no money, $50,000 of debt, and my first boss out of college told me um, that I was the worst employee he ever had and the company should fire me. 
And so that was very difficult to hear. How am I going to pay these loans? All the, all the fears and, and questions started coming up. And that's when the seed was really planted for me for uh, wanting to become a good leader, uh, wanting to become, uh, really turn things around, be a good employee, learn leadership skills. How can I help others? And eventually that transferred from working in someone else's company in a, a large gas company to starting my own company and really building my leadership skills along the way. Um, as a, a startup founder and CEO, I've learned a lot of valuable leadership lessons over the years um, that I'm happy to share today. And um, I learned most of them the hard way so I can share what hasn't worked and being on the receiving end of some poor leadership and what I've done to turn those things around. It's funny, isn't it? How, how often we learn the lessons from someone else doing it badly. I mean, that, that boss telling you that you should be fired. I mean, wow, that's a <laughs> shocking <laughs> leadership. <laughs> yeah, well, and the, the funny thing, and as, as a CEO um, today, um, there were looking back, it's almost comical and even how it impacted me because there were no procedures, no processes. Um, we were building servers. It had nothing to do with what, um, my training was. Uh, there was little mentorship or, or oversight. It was, uh, just go figure it out. We'll answer some questions for 30 minutes a week. And, uh, you know, and it, 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 the, the, the management style was ignore, ignore, ignore slap. Right. And that's that, that it, it just doesn't work. Right. So, um, I, I knew that I wanted to, from that point, build my leadership skills and, and not make other people go through what I went through. Absolutely. And I can only applaud that. The ironic thing is that that company, it was a career development program. So, um, I, I don't know who the, the development was more for the manager or for me, but, uh, <laughs> um, I, I certainly developed a lot and, uh, promised myself not to make others go through those things. So, um, it, it was ironic on many levels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way it was successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's what not to do. And fortunately, um, that company, um, you know, uh, made me go through those things, but paid for those their own, uh, you know, th they paid for my leadership training through, uh, some unfortunate things. But now I know what to, what to do and what not mm -hmm. to do thanks mm -hmm. to, uh, them footing the bill for that. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, it's, it's always best to look on the positive side, I think. Um, That's right. So tell us a bit more then about your journey over the last decade as you've been building your company, which, and I think you, you started out renovating properties yourself. And then obviously today, I think you've got, what is it, hundreds of, of properties that you're managing? That's right. And owning. Um, so, um, right. And the, the path was just one house at a time. So, um, after that initial experience, I knew that I wanted, something else for myself. I wanted to eventually be an entrepreneur. The seed had been planted. And I um, I went to business school actually in Europe um, to IE business school in Madrid, Spain. And I did the, um, my, it was a Fulbright scholarship. Um, it's a scholarship here in the US and, um, but also international scholars come to the US. It's an exchange program. And the, um, I, I went to business school and I learned about debt. I learned about real estate. I learned about investing businesses, startups. It's an entrepreneurial institution. And I realized that I wanted to go into entrepreneurship at some point. However, I didn't have the money. <laughs> I didn't have any of the real real world wherewithal at that point to um, just go from uh, no houses to thousands of homes. So I, I got back to the States in 2014. Um, after traveling in Europe, um, I had been... Um, all over different countries, seeing different models and how different different societies are working and living in Spain, different things. And I thought, you know what? I'm going back to the States. I want to um, I want to build this real estate business. I have the knowledge. And I went back to work actually for the same company that that boss told me I was the worst employee um, uh, in the world or at the company uh, for. So, but there were there. It's it's a big company. There was another role, and I thought, look, while I'm launching this business, I want a company. To work for that I know and that um, is stable so I can be bankable. And I started buying houses one at a time. It was, uh, um, I was buying houses for 10 years before I finally went out on my own. And it was just one renovation, one house at a time, one deal at a time, uh, one negotiation at a time, and just staying persistent, staying uh, consistent with my efforts and, and, and buying one by one. One step at a time, if you will. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, it, it, 
you don't get to hundreds of units by having no units and then mm-hmm. going to hundreds of units. It, cool. It's one transaction at a time. So, and along the way, I built systems and processes. I started hiring. Um, first, it was one uh, uh, virtual assistant in the Philippines. Next, it was another and another. So it was these building blocks over time and putting pieces in place, um, human capital, uh, systems, technology, um, now AI and other things. So just adding, bolting on tools to, to slowly grow over time. And, and that's, that's what I did. It was, I, I, it was an overnight, you know, quit your job story, uh, 10 years in the making and even 13, if you include the three years before. I started buying houses. So all along that time, I learned ways to improve my leadership and I'm excited to share those things. With the cost of properties, it's probably not something you can just literally do overnight, is it? So that's <laughs> right. Logically, that all makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. And, and each market, each market is different. So I should preface my, my upcoming comments with depending on your market and depending on what real estate is like in your area, the, the model that I did may or may not make sense, but there are, um, for, for the listeners areas. However, it could be any type of business. I mean, the principles are the same. So um, real estate was the vehicle that I chose, but the, the business principles are uh, are the same, re- regardless of which uh, which sector you're in. And so why, why did you choose real estate? Because that, that feels like quite a high barrier to entry when you're first starting out. Yes. Um, and it is. So I, when I got back to, so why real estate is because, um, I saw that there, there are so many benefits. Um, I had been putting money into like a 401k savings plan here in the States, they call it. And, um, I had to put in all the money. And then once you factor in the taxes later on the distributions, once you factor in that the rate of the, the returns are on a hundred percent of your money, there's no leverage. Um, when you factor in um, so inflation and other things, there's very little left. I mean, you might have a, a one to two percent net return, maybe three on average, and that's just not enough to move the needle. So I knew I needed to do something different. That was after three years of plowing everything I could into a four hundred one k. And then I understood leverage when I went to business school. I understood that if I put down uh, 20% of the value of a property or, um, we have FHA programs here. I put down three and a half percent. Um, I could control the entire asset, get all the upside, but only put in three and a half percent of the capital to buy that asset. And as long as the rents could support the debt, um, I saw only upward potential, um, which was at the time scary because 2014, there were still many foreclosures. Real estate was a scary time back then. So. Um, but I started under, I started piecing together those, uh, those themes in business school. And I never would have gotten exposed to real estate if it weren't for IE business school, um, and entrepreneurship. So th- the message is education and, uh, podcasts like this. There, there, there's, you know, YouTube. I mean, it's, it's the, the internet's the great equalizer. So getting educated, um, is the key. Well, obviously, I'm going to agree with that. Um, I'd be stupid to say anything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you know, there's there's quite a lot of business owners out there, certainly who could, could stand to remember, you know, that this that slowly but surely approach is valuable. Now, just because it's kind of a necessity in real estate doesn't mean that it's not a useful approach in other areas as well. So I think quite a few. And I've done this. I'm sure everyone's done it. Everyone who's a business owner, anyway. You, you get overexcited, don't you, with the potential that you see or the problem that you want to solve and you try and run before you can walk. And then before you, before you realize it, sometimes the money's run out or something else has fallen out under your feet and it's all gone wrong. <laughs> That's so true. I, in, in fact, before uh, this recording, I was just working on a, a framework for my team to avoid just that because I'll get excited about something, jump in. And then they have a hard time. Well, but Matt told me to do this yesterday, this, this, and this. How do I prioritize these things? So I want to give them a framework uh, to prioritize. And uh, um, and also, I need to restrain myself at times, too. Okay, we're working on enough. Let's not pile more on. I'll just confuse people. So <laughs> uh, that's something I've been working on recently as well that I'm not always the best at. Yeah, I think the first step is recognizing the problem, though, isn't it? As with 
everything. Um. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yes, yes. So I, I didn't have a framework for my folks to see, uh, to prioritize. Now, now we do, but uh, um, helping them prioritize has been key <laughs> over the last yeah. couple of months. So. Yeah. What is it about what you do that you love the most? I really like making deals happen. Um, I, and I like now, so up until earlier this year, I was going out and negotiating with all of the sellers. Um, and as context, we send out a lot of letters. Um, we do online marketing, Google ads and other things. When the sellers call in, we screen them and figure out if there's a chance to do a deal. And I love connecting with the, with the sellers, going to meet them and, uh, and solving their problems. I love solving problems, helping people. Um, and uh, figuring out how to best serve them. So it's it's really the people and the deal, the negotiation. Um, but more recently, one of the more rewarding things that I didn't expect, I thought that I wanted to you know, always be in the field talking with the sellers, but it's actually quite rewarding training my two acquisitions managers that I hired, teaching them the principles that I've learned over the last 10 years and watching them grow. It's... Um, it's quite rewarding, uh, and I'm not dealing directly with the sellers, but I'm working with my folks, giving them the skills to negotiate and solve problems, and it's forcing me to really get clear on what the principles are, why they work, and how to implement them, and to help someone else succeed. And there's nothing quite like it. Um, it's uh, I also have three children under three, and so with my my children, it's it's very similar. Obviously, in the sense of um, different because it's family, they're younger, but growing and building something, it's, it's more than just the systems and processes. It's the people helping us achieve as a, a company our highest potential and watching, watching as a leader, the folks on the team grow into their greatest potential to serve the customers. It's much more rewarding than that negotiation and day-to-day -day connection with, with the sellers that I thought I would miss. It's, it's quite rewarding watching others grow and, and achieving their full potential. Yeah. I mean, do you think it's just because you're getting to a different phase or stage of maybe not life, but career, let's say, and priorities change, don't they? It's you, you look at different things in different ways. Well, I, I was forced to change. I, you know, I, I, it wasn't that I, I had this epiphany from on high and I mm -hmm. said, Oh, well, this is a better way to do things. When, when my, my wife and I, we had our son and now, we, and we actually have twins that are four, 45 yeah. days old. Oh, wow. I was forced. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I was, I was forced to really hone in on my leadership skills. And of course, um, you know, there were at least nine months there, right? Where I could prepare and, and start hiring and things. So it wasn't a surprise, but earlier this year, I was, uh, 2023, I was forced to, okay, it's, it's make or break time because I'm not willing to compromise time with my family. That's a non-negotiable for me. And I can't do all this work, but I have ambition and I have goals and dreams and I'm driven and I can't ignore that. So the, the answer was, how can I become a leader? I didn't just, I didn't realize, oh, okay, if just if I became a leader a, and a better leader and really implement these things and build a company that that would help me achieve my goals faster. It was almost reverse. I'm not willing to give up time with my family. And it forced me to really implement the leadership principles that I had learned into my business and grow it through mentorship and coaching and training of, of my team. So it was almost a roundabout. Many entrepreneurs may get into their journey and they just know, I'm going to build a team. I'm going to build a company. That's what I want to do. And for me, I, I was a one-man show for a long time. I was double-hatting in my W-2 job. Um, I, I've been forced to, um, to grow a company and I'm happy that I did. I wish I would have realized it sooner. Yeah. Familiar words there as well. <laughs> if we were to summarize it in one word, it's, it's legacy, isn't it? And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, they probably see it the other way around. It's build the legacy in the business first. So you can focus on family. Whereas for you, it's the other way around potentially, isn't it? It is. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that I'm really being forced to channel my efforts into the, the, my highest value for the company, which is, which is leading the team and setting the vision and coaching, mentoring. Um, I saw something on social media earlier this week. The CEO is the chief encouragement officer. 
And it's, it's, I, I think there's some truth to it. It's kind of a funny kind of clickbait thing, but, um, I, I think it's, it's, it is true and it's about legacy and it's about, uh, developing others. And, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that I was forced to with my family because now I have what I, I dreamed about for my family, but also growing the business. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fair enough. And so if we look at the business itself, perhaps from, from the journey you've had so far and obviously with, the recent changes this year, what would you say are your top three things that you've learned from all of that process? So being crystal clear with what the tasks are that need to be done, what is the next step after that task is completed, and how do all these tasks fit together? In a word, processes. Um, we need to, um, we still need to really do a better job meshing as a team where and using automation and other tools to okay we finished this step that fires off a notification for the next step to close the deal and we've been building that in salesforce over the last uh, 4 or 5 months so we're getting pretty good at it we're not world class but um we're we're getting we're getting there so processes um the next is systems so um i mentioned salesforce really um when i was when i was working a full time job and buying houses it was all in my head and my Google calendar, just follow up with this person. And no, no one else could get into my head. No one else could. Um, we didn't have a system in case if you know, I was out of the office or someone else um, was following up. If they were out of the office, there's no central location. So systems help us coordinate things better, drive those consistent business practices between our phone software, Salesforce, and other um, other tools that we use. Um, that it helps us standardize what we do and provide a consistent product. Um, so those things and then training is number three. So processes, systems and training. Once we have the processes and we have the documents that explain how to do tasks, I've, one of the hurdles for me was, well, we have a document. How come they're not following it? <laughs> so it's the continuous education, um, the, uh, making meeting one on one with the employees, making sure they understand their roles. Just because we have a document somewhere out there in the ether doesn't mean the employees feel that they own it and that they can, uh, that they really, uh, they, they are in control and empowered to take action on those, those points. So, um, and, and do the procedure. So I, I would say those things, processes, systems and training. Um, have been the, the three big things that I've learned to really scale a team and grow a business. They're just essential. You, you, you can't, and I, I learned that in my full time job. There were, there were thousands of employees across the country. We had to refer back to what does the process say? Otherwise it didn't work. And, and that was one of the big takeaways from my full time job in scaling my business. I agree. I think I would add people to the list personally. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, of course. I mean, it was, it was implied, I think, but, yeah, but I think all three of those things stand out to me as things that are quite often overlooked. Um, particularly in small businesses, I think there's a, almost, uh, a desire to be seen as fast moving and agile and go getting and, and that, that can be seen as very opposite to writing down your process, <laughs> for example. Um, and certainly quite a few entrepreneurs I've worked with over the years have been almost actively resistant against the latter. But I think right. the value in it, um, over and above what you've said as well is it's, it's almost like creating built in redundancy, isn't it? So if someone gets ill or they're hit by a bus or the CEO has to retire for some reason or, or any critical person in that process chain is suddenly removed from it. If you've not done these things, if you've not got the processes written down, your systems in place and everyone trained on how to use them, then you've got a gap, you've got a bottleneck and suddenly the process falls over. But if you have done those, if you have done those things, then anyone in the business can just pick it up and run with it. Well, that's right. And, um, with the question being, what were the things that I, I learned the most? I mean, th the people is, you're, you're right, fundamental. The, the, the issue that I had was that I was focused on, um, uh, I was focused on really investing in training in, in the folks and I didn't have a long-term sustainable solution to coach them 
to empower them to and and so the three things that i mentioned are the base to really invest in the people it's almost a back door it, it's it almost seems counterintuitive the a, a lot of folks that i've seen they they spend a lot of time they'll they'll do you know team building events and let's build relationships and that stuff is great um employees need that they need to feel connected like they have a network but what i learned is that that gets so far and then when there's chaos <laughs> that that doesn't really build people or they don't have tools and resources it 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 kind of leaves them uh with a sense of things are lacking so 100% i mean the people are the most important the things that i focused on for my answer are more on um just the ideas of how do we support them and train them yeah no absolutely i get it and i think it's i guess we're talking about the the what and the why versus the how almost aren't we um, yes that's right yeah and they're, yeah. they're all you know if, if you don't have any single one of those then it's probably not going to work but that's right or at least not when times get stressful anyway <laughs> <laughs> what advice then would you offer a listener having been there yourself and, and done this quite successfully who is maybe considering taking that leap into their own business or starting a, a side hustle in inverted commas not a huge fan of that phrase but is quite descriptive and they're maybe not sure about where to start or whether they should do it at all yeah i i think first it starts with introspection so what do you really want what's your why um what do you want to accomplish for some folks starting a side hustle doesn't make sense and that's okay for others um it it may be exactly what they want to do but they just don't know where to start so i think it starts with your framework uh, what you uh, as a as an individual value, what you like, dislike, what your strengths and weaknesses are, and then from there, how do you decide on a side hustle? Um, I I explored multiple side hustles with my girlfriend, now wife, um, at the time. So you know, ten years ago, we were talking about different. Do we want to be in insurance or or the food business? And we settled on real estate, and it was just the the predictability, the um, the, the tax advantages and other things that, um, and my, I, I'm risk averse as a person and I could see the stability and so could, she, so could she, but uh, that might not work for someone who's a fast charging entrepreneur looking to do a tech startup. So you need to know your personality and what your values are. Um, and then, um, I would say start small. You don't need to, um, s some people say, well, burn the boats and, go all in. Otherwise you won't succeed if you have another option. I never saw it that way. Um, I, uh, I wanted the predictability and the stability and the bankability of having the full-time job while seeing if real estate made sense for me before I just went all in on a concept that I didn't know if it would work or not. Um, so I would say do some testing, start small, try things out. And if they work, Maybe double down, um, do a, just a little bit more over the coming months or years. And then if it continues to work, take the next step and, and start building more and more. Um, so I would say a gradual approach um, once you know what you want to do. Okay. Well, that sounds like good advice to me. I can't comment because I, I definitely did it the other way. <laughs> <laughs> more, more through bad judgment than planning. I think if I had to do it again, I'd follow the approach you've you've taken as well. I think I'm not as risk averse as I used to be, but I'm definitely risk averse. <laughs> well, I think you said the key word is a plan. Yeah. I mean, it's okay. Ha having what you like, dislike your personality, that's great. But if, if you just jump, <laughs> there's no plan yeah. that can be, um, it, there can be a lot more friction and pain than a calculated approach. Yeah. Yeah. I think as well, when it's your only source of income, um, figuring out it, figuring it out as you go is, um, uncomfortable. Let's, let's say. <laughs> I, I found for that's, that's right. And I found that it was a lot easier to grow a business when I had access to capital through borrowing with lenders. And so I started, I said, I didn't think of myself first. Well, what do I want to do? I thought, well, who am I serving? How can I serve more of those folks? And it came back to getting loans. It, 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 it's a leverage game. It, it, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a borrowing debt structure. 
So what do I need? To, so if I want to serve more of those folks, and in order to do that, I need to get more money. What do I need to do to get more money? <laughs> it was have a job. <laughs> so uh, you don't have to do that, but that was the way. Um, that was the way that I, I chose to do things because I could get great financing terms. I could cash out refinance because I had a job that maybe if it were a riskier borrower, the lender wouldn't do that. So it was this catch 22 where I couldn't devote all my time to real estate because I was working a full time job, but I needed the job to get the loans to buy more real estate. So that's why I held on in both spaces for so long. But I'm not saying that's for everyone, but it was a, it was certainly a planned approach. Practicality has to, has to almost be the priority, doesn't it? In a lot of respects, you know, you, you can only do what you can do to, to well, make it a bit cliche. But. Sure. Well, <laughs> and it's true because if you, it, the, the, the feeling of that, um, that inspiration, I'm going to, that I'm going to go change the world. That feels good for about 30 minutes. And then you get hit with rejections for financing and you get hit with, Oh, I train an employee for two months and they quit and, uh, and all these setbacks. And so it, really taking a calculated strategic approach, where am I going? How am I going to get there? Mapping it out, taking that time, take a day or two and really think through where you're going and how you're going to get there because you will figure out those lessons one way or another. And it's, they, the principles are always the same. And you might as well plan up front. Otherwise, you'll learn the lessons the hard way later. Trust me, I know. I, I've i made a lot of mistakes in my career. And um, taking a little bit more time to plan and, for, and, and try to see just a few more steps down the road could have saved me a lot of heartache and, uh, and loss. <laughs> what is it? If you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. There we go. Yes. Um, yes, that's right. Um, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone's done that at some point in their lives. Um, yeah, I guess the important thing is not to do it in a way that's not recoverable. <laughs> well, that's that's the thing. And I've watched people close to me and some business colleagues blow themselves up, you know, trying to go too big too fast. And um, it's just, it, it, yeah, it, a calculated approach can can save you from a lot of those things if you can stay pragmatic, practical. Um, planned, but it's hard because you get excited and you want to jump steps. Indeed, you're fighting the two sides of human nature, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> what do you think is the biggest leadership lesson that you've learned from your whole career so far? If I'm not leading myself, I can't lead others, and so that starts about that starts with doing the right things for myself. Um, whether that is maintaining a healthy diet, exercise, maintaining discipline and control for myself. Uh, because if I, if I can't do that for me, I'll have a hard time running an organization, um, or having a family where those principles are valued and where those behaviors are encouraged. So really living the type being the leader actually doing the things that you say, doing them consistently over time. Um, and that's the hardest thing because it's really easy to you know, stress picks up or things in life happen in, and in business. And it's easy to slip back to the least productive habits that we have. And we, we fall to, we don't rise to our, I, I heard this somewhere that we don't rise to the level of our expectations, we fall to our, our worst habits or something like that. We fall to our default and our default setting. And so really focusing on living and being the leader that, uh, that you need to be, you can't just preach to others. You have to live it. And, uh, that's something that I'm, I'm really working on right now is okay. I have all these other time commitments. I want to be a good father. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good CEO to my, my employees and my team, what do I need to do to, to level up and be the leader that they need? You're talking around one of my favorite aspects of effective leadership, which is leading by example. It's, mm. it's, you know, it's walking the talk. And I think, you know, again, this is one where a lot of leaders, and I think for the reasons that you've explained most often, at least, they, they kind of go off the rails a little bit. And there's, 
I think it's, it really comes down to three three elements, doesn't it? It's it's what what are the values that drive why you're doing the business, why you're being the leader, why you are doing what you're doing effectively. There's the words, which is what you say about those values and how you communicate with your people, with the team, in and outside of the business. And then there's the last one, which is where people sometimes fall down, which is the actions. Mm. And I think we've all probably worked for a manager or a leader at some point in our lives. Um, I know I have. I think you have from the story you started the episode with. <laughs> Who will say all these glorious and wonderful things that you really want to believe and you can easily see yourself getting inspired and getting behind that leader. And then the next day you turn around and they're, when it comes to their actions, being the exact opposite of what they said they were going to do yesterday. And I think that's where leading by example can be really powerful if you get it right, but sadly equally dangerous if you get it wrong. That's, uh, those are, that, that's a, a great response. And, um, I, I see it with my, my two year old. It, it's as simple as this is a very simple example, but if, if I'm using my phone, he wants the phone and he wants to be on the phone and not, not playing with me or not engaging in our conversation. And we want to be present at dinner and at meals. And so just by, me slipping and doing not doing the little things right it undermines our our principle of hey we're going to connect over dinner right so um i i see it and it's 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 that's a very simplistic example but it's true at the highest levels of leadership it's quite entertaining i think how often the phone comes up in this kind of conversation around leading by example <laughs> the, the two-year-old is, is a new one um interesting the other one I find is is in meetings or conversations and someone just can't put their phone down and focus on that conversation. And it, it's the same thing, I guess. It's just in a work context. That's right. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, I don't know. I think sometimes we're at the mercy of, of the modern technology, aren't we? Oh, trust me. I'm, I'm, I'm just, as, just as guilty um, on conference calls and sending emails and things. But I really try, I try to, especially for one-on-ones, mm. um, and family time being present and, and connecting with, with the employee because they can sense, they can sense when you're not there, mm -hmm. um, when you're checked out. Um, and, uh, that especially in one-on-ones and, and, uh, or even team meetings and other things, it's just, it, it, it's, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't live up to our values. So leading yeah. by example. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which maybe leads us into the next question quite nicely. What would you say are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen leaders make? Not taking ownership, full ownership for the results of the company. And what I mean by that is um, if someone makes a mistake, it's easy to blame that person. It's harder not impossible, but harder to look internally and say, what did I miss? What training could we have done? What document could we have had to clarify these things so that the employee had the appropriate information to not make that mistake? I think the underlying assumption, therefore, is starting with the assumption that people are there to do the best that they can. They need to be developed, trained, and invested in. They're not intentionally trying to sabotage the business. Um, so looking internally as a leader and saying, what do I need to own? How do, how can I take ownership and do what needs to be done? So the team has more resources and what do I need to do to make a change here? So everyone else can improve. Mistakes are an interesting one. And it, it sometimes surprises me why this is such a controversial area as well. Cause to me, I guess there's a question of scale and severity, isn't there? I agree that the leader should be the one owning the mistake in terms of even if all it is is an internal thing to protect your people from that exact blame culture. But at the same time, I think sometimes you need to give people the freedom to, to fail because failure is where the lessons are, isn't it? Ultimately, I think it's much harder to learn from never making a mistake and just always succeeding almost by accident than it is from what you've learned in that one failure that 
you, you want to understand why it didn't work. But then if we're talking about the scale as in the whole business is failing and then the leader is not taking responsibility for that or taking the appropriate steps or actions to try and address it, then I think, yeah, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. But it is, yeah, there is, there's a bit of nuance there, I think. Oh, oh, of course, of course. There's, um, there's a lot be, and absolutely allowing folks to fail. It's not that making a mistake is bad. I, I think where leaders mess up is they, they tend to blame and criticize employees or think, oh, that was their fault rather than looking at the mistake as an opportunity for growth and learning and then capturing that mistake growth and learning in a way that it can be taught for future employees or as a learning opportunity for the organization, not blaming and saying, oh, well, that person doesn't know or, but how can we capture these learnings and use them? Yeah. I think the the problem with the blame thing is it, it removes the possibility to learn, doesn't it? Because all you're it doing does. is just saying, well, that was that person's fault. That's it. We've drawn a line under it now. Let's move on. And you've not really, as you say, you've not understood why that went wrong, what you could do differently, what the lessons are, what, what we can grow from. Um, and so you've lost that opportunity. And more often than not, that same mistake will happen again in a week's time or a month's time. That's right. That's right. If you had to choose one feature, one behavior, let's say, that you would most associate with successful leadership, what would that be? Working alongside your team so that they can see that you're a part of the team and you're not the supreme leader delegating from on high, being approachable and relatable to your, your folks and really rolling up your sleeves and working alongside them, not doing their job, not taking away from what they're doing, but showing them that you're engaged in what they're going through, being supportive to them and, and, and listen to them. Um, and creating two way conversations. Um, so I, I think that's, that's the, when they know you care as a leader, that you genuinely care about them and their well being and their performance, I think that's a game changer. I, I like it. Yeah. And I agree. It's, it's a very tricky line to walk though, I think, which I think new leaders struggle with almost as much as kind of the, 30 year veteran leaders who've been doing it for so long because there's, there's an aspect of vulnerability there, isn't there? And having to, or being open to that two way conversation, as you say. Uh, and it always reminds me of this eternal question, perhaps is the way to describe it about whether you can be a friend as well as a leader. And there's, you know, I see both sides of the argument on this one. And I, I, I kind of flip flop a bit between each one, depending on what month it is. <laughs> I, I agree. I, and I've gone back and forth as well. Um, when I was a newer leader, um, I, I was a six year manager for the large company I, I, I talked about. And I would, I would spend an hour or two hours in my office with an employee. Le what I thought at the time. So, okay, building trust and letting them get to know me and, and a certain degree of that was true. However, eventually it, it almost transitioned from building trust and being vulnerable to, in a sense, a dumping ground of just negative feelings. And you have to, you have to hear people out and you have to make them feel heard. But I would say not at the expense of, uh, getting things done and putting the business priorities as the, the top mission. Um, but still hearing folks and meeting them where they're at is important. I try to empower the, the team and I'll meet with them. We'll discuss the challenges, but at the end of the day, it's their, their responsibility to solve them. I can be a sounding board. Um, I can share from my experience, be vulnerable, share how I made mistakes in the past. But, um, at the end of the day, they need to be empowered and not uh, push all their monkeys onto me, so to speak. I, I've made that mistake. <laughs> yeah, I, I know what you mean. And I do agree, you know, it's imp very important to, to hear people out and make them feel heard. And I think the difficulty for leaders is, particularly when there's that in the negative spiral, let's call it. Yes. If all you're doing is listening to the, the complaint and the negativity, then there becomes an expectation that having sat and listened to all of that, you're then going to do something about it. 
even right. though it's most likely not within your control to do so. <laughs> well, that's and right. So, uh, how you handle that is really important. And I, I like the approach you've described. I think that's a good way to do it. Well, right. You can listen and validate someone's feelings, um, express that it must be frustrating to be going through what they're going to do, and then ask them what they what they plan to do about it. So in our company, we have the 131 framework, which is, and everyone on the team knows, if they're coming to me with a problem, so they need to clearly state the one problem, then they need to suggest three solutions to resolve the problem, and then they need to pick the one best solution and explain why. I I got caught up in hearing folks out for the sake of wanting to build connections, which it did, but also reinforce the behavior that Matt will take on all these problems that I bring to him. And I've over time shifted things back to the person bringing the problem to say, what can you do to solve that problem? And not just trying to connect for connection's sake, but for a, a practical outcome that benefits the team and the business. Yeah. No, I like it. And it's, yeah, obviously effective. I think the only other thing I would add is that every so often there will be a problem that they can't solve. And so those are the ones I think that as a leader you most want to hear about because that's the ones you need to get involved in potentially, or at least go a bit further in terms of helping with the solution. That's right. Um, We have the 21 minute rule where someone should spend 20 minutes on an issue. If they consult with their colleagues and they research our procedures and still cannot come up with a solution, they would do the one three one and escalate. Um, because I also don't want folks getting stuck for days on something that if we pull together a few people from different groups for 15 minutes, we could fix. Many brains better than one. Oh, absolutely. I'm hearing a lot of the cliches today. On oh, I need to get a bingo card or something. <laughs> if you could go back in time to the start of your career or let's say the the day you bought your first property for for renovating would you do anything differently i would have probably taken on a little bit more risk and grown a little bit faster uh, i think that uh my aversion to risk is properly noted however I should have identified what real risks were and what real risks were not. And I would have moved faster to grow the business that I knew at the time worked, but that fear got in the way because the risks were perceived risks. And I had all of the mitigation efforts in place to reduce those risks to, I would have invested more faster but my own fear held me back. Well, that's interesting. I, I think risk risk management is is always a it's one I struggle with as well. So I think that it, it's it shouldn't be, but I find it's quite often dependent on mindset. And so you start to see more risks and more potential pitfalls than perhaps are realistically ever going to happen. And so I think that's why it's so interesting. Your answer there is what what risks are realistic. And that, that is a skill of its own, I think, being able to do that. Yeah, there's the, I realized over time, there's the magnitude and then there's the likelihood. Um, so I was amplifying in my own mind and fear was doing it that, well, this could be really bad if this happens. And it would be. But what's the probability? What's the likelihood? And um, I... Uh, I misjudged the likelihood. Now, it's easy to say that in hindsight. However, um, I identified all of the risks, but I did not understand the probability of those risks happening. Had I understood that component to risk mitigation, it may have been a game changer for me. Yeah, but I think at the same time, don't be too hard on yourself because a lot of knowing and understanding the likelihood is from experience isn't it because if if you especially if you've never done something before you've no idea how likely it is that a certain thing might or might not happen so yeah i know i asked the question so it was a bit unfair but (laughs) (laughs) well you 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 bring up a good point it's just that uh i i think um i i think i could have well 
I, I've read so many things and read so many books. So I, I, I did what I was able to do at the time. So um, I'm not second guessing, but I, I wished that I had understood the probability framework sooner. Um, maybe I still would have made the same choices, but I didn't understand the framework. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Leadership Heroes. Okay, well, I've only got one more question for you, and this is my favorite question. Uh, everyone gets asked this one because it's my favorite question. It's called Leadership Heroes. So if you had to pick one person, they could be anyone you like, alive or dead, past or present, real or, or fictional, if you like, as well, who, in your opinion, would perfectly embody leadership, who would that person be and why? Well, I... um He's definitely not perfect, um, but um, he did some great things and built great companies. Um, Sam Zell, um, he, uh, late Sam Zell, um, passed earlier this year, um, the author. So he's basically the, the founder of the REIT industry. Um, and I think that that is, it was a pioneering concept at the time, um, pulling together all the, all these funds, um, and basically making publicly traded stocks out of, out of real estate. And to do that and, and the, the challenges that his family overcame, uh, just to, just to get to the United States, um, during World War II and the journey they went through and, um, and then what Sam was able to create. Um, he's definitely made a, a, a great impact on me. I've read his book, um, Am I Being Too Subtle? Uh, many times. And, uh, I, I, I think, um, I think he's a great leader for what, he accomplished and built um, again, not perfect. Um, he's somewhat of a polarizing person, but I, I I see the good side of of Sam. Okay, interesting. Not one I'm familiar with. Um, you have to tell us a bit more. I think what, you say he was quite polarizing. Can you tell us a bit more about why? Well, he he was very um, very direct um, and very just to the point and um, and just very driving. Um, very you know he he was driven to succeed. He knew the opportunities in front of him and. Um, he, he went for them and, uh, he, he wasn't a builder. He bought existing assets and he, um, it, it was really a, uh, a different type of, of thinking and, uh, just rather, rather driving. He pushed his team hard, but, uh, was, uh, it, it came from a place of caring and, uh, and going for what he wanted to achieve. And given the industry that he's in and the industry you're in, I'm guessing there was a, an inspiration there as well. <laughs> it, it is, it is, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks ask me too, they say, well, you know, are you looking to build? Are you looking to develop? And, and Sam didn't do much of that. So he, um, he would buy existing assets and, uh, and that's, that's what I do, you know, repositioning assets. And, um, I, I think it's a, a great model. Um, he raised capital, um, uh, and, and I haven't done that just yet, but he's been an inspiration for me. Excellent. Well, I think that's quite a good answer. I'm going to have to go away and, and look him up and maybe read his book as well. <laughs> yeah, lots lots of great principles, not just for uh, it, it's it's for life and not not just for real estate. But mm -hmm. um, I I really respect him. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, we're, we're nearly out of time, so all that's really left for me to ask you is if any of the listeners would like to learn more about you and what you do, would you? Care to point them towards your website or LinkedIn profile or? Absolutely. Um, I am, my website is peasonproperties.com. Um, on all social media as Peas on Properties and, uh, happy to connect with your listeners. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Well, it's been great having you and, and lovely conversation as well. Matt, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'll put your website in the episode description as well so people can find it easily and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, David. You as well. Well, listeners, I hope you were inspired by Matt's story, and I hope you've taken loads of important learnings from his experiences today. If you would like to learn more about Matt, what he does, if perhaps you live in his area and you're looking for somewhere to move to, I've popped his website in the episode description so you can find that reach out i'm sure he'd love to hear from you thank you so much again to matt for his time today great conversation loved hearing all those stories and i had fun so i hope everyone else did as well and once again listeners it can be lonely at the top but it doesn't have to be 
Leadership can be an isolating experience, but it doesn't have to be. When you are doing it for the first time, when you're in your first manager role, it's easy to feel unsupported when so many new managers aren't given the same access to leadership development, to training, to executive coaching as some of the more senior executives. Leadership is tough. The AI can't do it for you, nor can any other tech. So to help you solve these problems, as I may have mentioned at the beginning of the episode, I run an online leadership community. It's called Integrity Leaders. It is there for new managers, first-time leaders just like you who are operating in tech-driven, tech-focused, high-technology environments or companies or teams. And yes, that is a pretty wide niche in this day and age because who can operate a business without some level of tech these days? But nevertheless, it is there to help. Right now, you can join for free for 60 days. All I ask in return for that is that you engage with the community, get to know some of the other members, have a look at some of the content, take some of the training courses, all of it's included, and then give me your honest feedback because it is a relatively new thing. We are trying to improve it all the time. And so we do need feedback from managers and leaders just like you. So to find out more, visit www.leadernotaboss.com. You can sign up there for the newsletter that accompanies this podcast. And as soon as you do that, you will get a welcome email and you will get an exclusive invite to join the Integrity Leaders community. So I hope to see you on there very soon. At that website and at every stage of the process, there are opportunities to get in touch with me directly if you have questions before you join. Or failing that, my LinkedIn profile is also in the episode description as is the web address that i've just given so reach out anytime always happy to hear from you and as you might have guessed from the existence of this podcast i always am happy and excited to talk about leadership so don't be afraid to reach out for just an informal chat always happy to do that that's almost all i have time for i hope you'll join me again next week we're staying in the real estate world although a slightly different side of it and i'll be interviewing mike tading of norhart And we'll be hearing all about his unique, different, forward-looking, very modern approach to leadership and management in the construction industry. So rather at the other end of the real estate market. It's going to be a very interesting conversation. There's all kinds of very cool ideas that he's implemented in his business, including, for example, unlimited paid time off, which is pretty rare generally, but especially so in the construction sector. So we'll be hearing about that experience and how that's gone for the company, what he's learned from it, and many more lessons besides. So I hope you'll be there with us and listen along. Until then, don't forget to avail yourself of all of the links in the episode description. Stay safe. I hope your 2024 is continuing to be off to a great start and be a leader, not a boss. (laughs) 